have, um, I have returned so much to the old book, you know? I used to be in the Bible app season, but then I realized that every time a notification went off, I just left my Bible app. I went to something else. So I was a very bad phone Bible reader, and also bad phone Bible reader, okay? So I've had to switch back to the Bible, and I suggest it highly. First Kings chapter 18, Elijah on Mount Carmel. We're gonna start in verse 22. First Kings is like this much into the Bible. All right, we are gonna be at chapter 20, verse 22. Elijah went before the people and said to them, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves, let them cut it into pieces, and prepare it on wood to be set fire. I will prepare the other bull and put it on wood and have it not set fire. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of my God. The God who answers by fire, he is God. The people said, what you say is good. Basically, they're like, all right. Elijah says to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given to them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. O Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought. Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's traveling. Maybe this God is sleeping. This God must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords, which was custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued in their frantic prophesying until it was time for evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. So Elijah said to all the people, come here. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He dug a trench around it large enough to hold two says of seed. He arranged the wood and cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars of water and pour it on the offering on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known that today you are God in Israel and I am your servant, have done all these things at your command. Answer me, God. Answer me so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that... you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood and the stones and the soil, it licked up the water from the trench. All the people saw this, they fell prostrate before God and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. This entire story is saying, Elijah, solo, heads to this moment against 450 of Baal's prophets, He says, let me see if your God can do it. I think my God can. They say, yeah, our God can. He says, show me. They try. Their God doesn't. He says, watch my God. Bam, God does it. That's the whole story, okay? That's what I just spent like six minutes reading, right? Yes. You're looking for a Cliff Notes version of the Bible? (laughs) Just kidding. You should for sure read the whole thing. So 1 Kings 18, 22, that's what we're walking through here. And this is ultimately a story of trust. This is ultimately a story of Elijah showing us and proving to us what extreme trusts look like. Have you guys ever had to really trust someone? Um, When I was 19, I was on my semester abroad through Europe, um, and I was in Switzerland, and I had always wanted to skydive my whole life. It was like on my life bucket list. And uh, this guy was walking down the street wearing like a polo shirt that just said like skydiving on it. And he was like, anybody want to skydive? This is really how I found him, okay? And I was walking down the street with my friends, and I was like, yeah, me. I want to skydive. He was like, all right. 
uh, let's sign up here. He pulled out an iPad. He started to talk about Skydive Switzerland. And I was with six of my friends. And I said to them, guys, let's do this. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. We've got to do this. Out of the six of them, five of them signed up with me to go skydiving. We all went together uh, that, to, back to our hostel that night. And in the morning at 7 a.m., a car comes to your hostel and picks you up. So this car came and picked us up. And I had had like read quite a bit about um, what skydiving is like in the US. There's like hours of training, that there's like a course that you have to go through all these things, that it was like a very extensive process. The end of the day ended in you skydiving. So I was prepared for everything. Well, we got there. We got to like a plane hangar in the middle of the Swiss Alps. And I walked in, and there's a man standing, and he's wearing, um, have you ever seen a Velcro wall, right? Okay, imagine that suit with no Velcro on it, okay? So he's just wearing that, and he's like, all right, guys, put these on. I was like, okay. So I put on a Velcro suit, no Velcro, okay? I zip it all the way up. I'm saying to my friends, like, okay, this is probably the start of a long, you know, extensive day of training. This man walks in, and his name is Hans. And Hans says, okay, Hans is like, who's ready to skydive? And I was like, yeah, you know? And I was still like fresh and 19. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, okay. Um, and he said, okay. Um, he's like, okay, me and you to me. He's like, we'll be together. It's like, okay. He goes, when I go like this, you go like this. I was like, okay, what? He was like, so I was like, okay. <laughs> right? He's like, yeah, okay. Let's go. And I was like, where? He was like, in the plane. I was like, to do what? He was like, let's go to skydive. I was like, this is all the training that you're going to give me before I get in a plane with you, Hans? Right? He was like, it's OK, it's OK. I'm with you, it's OK. I was like, OK. I see my friends go through a kind of similar experience. And truly, we got there at 8 a.m. By 9 a.m., I'm entering the plane. So I'm walking in the plane. We line up. And we lined up in order of who was the most scared. Like, I have one guy friend in front of me who, like, is fearless. And then I have, like, a couple friends. And I have a friend on the end who, like, I can tell hasn't talked since we woke up. And she feels kind of sick, right? So that's the order that we're in. We get in the plane. And all of us are strapped to a man, like, head to toe. Okay, So I'm strapped fully to Hans. And we walk in the plane, and I sit down, and I'm like kind of sitting on him in a funny way. And we sit down on this bench in a tiny plane, and it starts to take off. And my whole life, I've had this personality that's kind of tricky, where people think they can mess with me. And you have that kind of personality, like, eh, you know? If you're like a little bit like more talkative, people feel like they can kind of like, you know, get you a little bit. So Hans starts saying things like, um, oh, does that strap look OK? Hans, I don't know. I don't know if that strap looks okay. Yes, I don't know. He's like, ha, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I was like, I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm going to die, right? I'm going to die. This is it. So we take off. He starts doing this a couple more times. He's like, amen, amen, to his buddies. Amen, 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 amen. You think, you think that she's clipped right here? I can't tell. I'm like, Hans, I can't tell either, bro. I don't know. I can't see back here, right? So the door closes, and we get higher and 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 higher, and we're over like a patchwork quilt Swiss Alps. I mean, like the Alps, it's like a, out of a movie, right? We're getting higher and higher and higher. And the plane just keeps getting higher, right? Like I can see its shadow, and then I'm like, whoa, it gets real small, OK? And then what happens is something that your entire life you are trained to not have happen. The door opens on the plane, OK? And in my head, I think, Close it! Close the door! Close that! And I realize, I have paid for this. <laughs> I have paid to be here. This was not only my choice, I have put a lot of money on dying, right? I was like, what have I done? What is happening? Not only me, but my friends trusted me, and I am trusting Hans! Hans has my whole life in his hands, right? It's all on Hans. And we go higher and higher.
higher, the door is open, it's so loud, you're wearing like goggles that I think are from the dollar store, okay, it's like <laughs> that. I'm just going high, I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And as the door opens, I realize that the, it, the way that we entered is the opposite way that you'll exit, <laughs> right? So now we're in order of most afraid going first. <laughs> so my, my poor friend Elise, who I think maybe has wet her pants at this point, but I'm not sure, right? <laughs> This is all I see. You know, we're, we're like at a level of the mountains, okay? It's like me and the mountains are at the same place. And that's all I can see. And I can see her, and this is all I see happen. She's in front of me. Her guy says, um, ready, ready. And I see her saying, no, 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 no. And I see him saying, okay, three, two, one. And they fell out of the plane. That was it. There was never a point where she gave him a thumbs up. <laughs> Not one point. And she's just out of the plane. Dead, probably, right? <laughs> and Han starts to scoot me forward, and I'm like, oh my gosh, here we go. This is it. This is the end for me, Lord. I hope that it's been good. Here we go. I start to scoot forward more and more and more. I get to the front, and Han says, you ready? And I say, no, no, wait, ah, and he says, three, two, and then I fall out of the plane with Hans, right? And in this moment, I remember that earlier in the day when we had met Hans, he had said, like, oh, you, pl you planned this? I was like, oh, yeah, these are my friends. I, like, wanted to do this. He's like, okay, cool, you want to do tricks? I was like, yeah. <laughs> That's in the moment. I thought it was right, okay? And in this moment, I knew it was wrong, okay? And when someone says to you at any point in your life, do you want to do tricks? Just so you know, the answer is a blanket no, okay? There's never a time when that was a good call. So we fall out of the plane, and I'm falling, which just so you know, skydiving is not a thing. You're just falling, okay? So we fall out of the plane, and he goes, I can hear him doing something like, woo, okay? He turns all the way back over, and so I can see my friends fall out of the plane, okay? That's, so he wants me to watch them slowly fall out of the plane. We turn back over, we're falling, flying, falling, flying, and when um, the, this moment was sold to me by that man in the polo shirt on the street, um, he, said, uh, I said, he said, how much is it? And I was like, well, that's kind of a lot of money, you know? Uh, and he was like, but it's 49 seconds of free fall. And I was like, 49 seconds, that's nothing. Like, I, can't, I can't feel like that much money for a long time. And then he went like this to me. Oh, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000, five. He's like, I'm on five, right? I was like, whoa. <laughs> uh, so I'm falling for a long time, like for a long enough time to where after your brain goes like, ah, you're like, whoa, okay. And I started to think things, truly, this is honest, I started to think things like, this is how birds feel. <laughs> birds always get to feel like this. Lucky birds, okay? And then I started to think things, truly, I thought to myself, wow, God, this is unbelievable. First, please let me live. Second, God, this is really cool, and I hope that I can take risks with you and for you. I remember truly praying on the way down, like, God, I want to trust you. I want to know you. God, I want to experience you. God, make me brave. And I slowly began to fall and have this kind of spiritual existential crisis when you're in the middle of the air in the Swiss Alps. And then in the very end, it's very scary. He taps you, and then you're supposed to put your arms up. But then you were also supposed to sit with your legs, but he didn't really tell me that super well, right? So we crashed, kind of. But I ended fine. And we, we, then I just laid down, I unclipped from him on this field in the middle of the Swiss Alps, and I laid down and looked up and just watched the rest of my friends <laughs> jump out of the plane and fall. And I could be there with them. And we processed afterwards this idea of trust. I was with some Christian friends on this trip. This idea of are we the kind of people who are willing to trust someone? Are we the kind of people who say things like, oh, I trust God, but I don't know if we really know what that means, right? I don't know if we have actual context for that. And tonight, I want to look at this story of Elijah as a man of trust. As a man who said, God, I am going to trust you no matter the outcome. I am going to trust you because I know your character. I am going to trust you when I am by myself. God, I'm going to trust you. 
But I also want to look out how his um, level of trust sometimes is hard for us and causes us to waver. Let's pray. God, thank you once again that you are present here tonight. Thank you, God, for the insane reality that you were present with Elijah and you are present here tonight and you are the exact same God. Thank you, God, that you reveal things about yourself in your word and that is why you have given us this good book. Father, for any of us in this room who are filled with distraction or discouragement, anxiety or fear or God for those in the room for whom even the word trust brings up a lot. God, would you be so ever present in this moment? Would you give them a clear heart and mind and head to see and experience you? Father, may your Holy Spirit be so rich in this room. Thank you, God, that your word does not return void. Teach us, Lord, how to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. These are the three things I think tonight we are going to walk in in the story of Elijah. And the first one, as we saw, is that Elijah shows up alone against 450 other prophets and says, my God is going to do something. Now, I think there's a tricky thing that we say a lot in Christian circles especially, but we, we're all about community and being together. And friends, it is incredibly true that you are not ever supposed to do life alone. You were created for community. But I do believe that you are not supposed to do life alone, but sometimes you are going to have to believe by yourself. You were not created to do life alone, but there will be seasons of your life where you have to believe by yourself. If you haven't experienced this yet, I promise it's coming. What does your faith look like when you're by yourself? What do you think about Jesus when you're alone? Do you think about Jesus when you're alone? Because the truth is, friends, if you have a faith that is entirely dependent upon group belief, there will come a day when that group dissipates. Whether that is out of transition or move or church or college or friendships falling apart, whatever that looks like, if your faith is entirely dependent upon the status of a group, there may come a day where it falls apart. Elijah shows us here that he can trust God when it is just him. He can stand in front of a crowd of people and say, I recognize that you believe something different than I do. And guess what? I'm going to keep believing my thing. What we do today instead is, is, oh, there's a lot of people who believe that. I'll do that. Oh, now we all believe that? Okay. Okay. Oh, whoa, now we all believe that again? Okay. You believe that? You're weird. I'm over here, I believe this. No, I don't, never mind, she's weird. I believe that guy, right? And then we go through this exhausting, exhausting thing where we are believing whatever the person we like most believes. And our faith becomes dependent upon whoever we like most, their belief in something. There's this amazing moment in scripture. In fact, I had the privilege of teaching on it at MOVE in the last couple years. And it's one of my all-time favorite passages. But I will just never forget when Jesus says to his disciples, who does everyone else say that I am? And they say like, oh, they say you're Elijah? Funny, huh? They say you're a prophet. They say you are uh, John the Baptist. And Jesus says, cool, cool, cool. Who do you say that I am? There's this incredible moment where Jesus says, all right, thank you for informing me what everyone else thinks of me. I actually did in fact know that. I would like to know what you alone say that I am. Then he says, Peter, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Messiah. And he says, Peter, on this rock I will build my church. 
Friends, it is an unbelievable thing that I will stand by for the rest of my life that when we understand who God is, God will inform us who we are. When we understand who God is and fight the good fight by ourselves to discover who God is, we are going to simultaneously discover what we've always wanted to know, which is, who am I? This is how all these incredible relationships throughout scripture work. God, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? God's like, this is who I am. And then, and then it's like, God, who am I? He's like, I'll tell you. This is who you are. You're like, whoa. <laughs> and it's this beautiful moment. You were never supposed to do life alone, but friends, there are going to be seasons where you have to believe by yourself. We can learn a lot from Elijah standing alone against a crowd. The second thing we learn is in verse 27. It says this. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. He said, shout louder, shout louder. He must be busy or deep in thought. These people prophesied until there was time for the evening, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Have you ever thought um, that God wasn't listening? I have. And I like preach about God. Right? Have you ever thought that prayer is just like thinking hard about something? Have you ever, like, you ever thought like, is that prayer like literally floating <laughs> up to God? Should I put that prayer in an envelope? Should I mail it somewhere? Right? I don't know about you, but I have absolutely have seasons where I have felt like, God, I know that you aren't listening. Because God, if you were listening, you would have done something. Friends, there's this beautiful moment with Elijah where Elijah, who just this entire week is such an amazing person to study because this guy goes from high, high to low lows. This guy goes from, just trust me, trust me, God is God, God will prove himself, God proves himself, to like napping under a tree, to like sleeping with some person, to like then angry at everyone, then he's like, God, kill me right now, I should die forever. That's his like emotional arc, Okay. But where we find ourselves tonight is him in this season of saying, God, I want to trust you. God, I know I can trust you. God, show up here. But friends, I just want to create space tonight to let you know that it's okay if you have had seasons where you have felt like God is not listening to you. It's okay if you've had seasons where you don't know what it means or looks like to trust God. Because what I have found that is absolutely amazing about God is that your understanding of who God is does not change who God is. Your doubt or fear or anger or disbelief or your feeling that he is not listening does not change the fact that we know throughout scripture that we have a God who turns his ear to you. That we have a God who knows your name and your story. We have a God who knows every hair on your head. We have a God who has counted every tear you have cried. Friends, we read in the book of Psalms that this God is closer than your very breath. You have a God, friends, who is in fact listening. And it's okay if you want to mourn that you have prayed without response. What's crazy is you're allowed to be mad at God. God is not concerned. God is not saying, oh, chill out. Have you ever read Psalms? Okay? I want to just tell you exactly how Psalms go. Maybe we've talked about this, right? This is exactly how the book of Psalms goes. I could sing of your love forever. Kill everyone. (laughs) Kill their horses. Kill their chariots. Take their land. Burn it then raise up their sons and kill them. (laughs) Then their daughters, dead. Then their harvests, black. I could sing of your love forever. Yeah, Selah. Okay? (laughs) That is, that is, I'm not kidding you, the book of Psalms, right? Read it. Take the time to read it, okay? And here is the craziest part. Psalms is written by David, comma, a man after God's own heart, period. (laughs) Right? Friends, if you are not bringing your anger or rage or pain or doubt or fear or trust to God, you are putting it somewhere else. 
If you are not bringing all of who you are before God and saying, God, I don't know what to do with this, but I'm mad. God, I don't know how to process this, but I feel angry. God, I doubt that you're real at all, and I don't know what to do. If you haven't figured out how to doubt or process or lean into Christian community, that's why it's here. For some reason, we've decided to doubt in all the wrong places. We've decided to be angry in all the wrong spaces. We've decided to run to all the people who are farthest from God when we feel farthest from him. I just want you to know that the church um, was designed for that. If you can't be real there, I don't know where else you can be. Bring all of who you are before God. And friends, if you feel like this God is not listening, the good news is it doesn't change whether or not this God is. You get to bring yourself to the table and ask God to show you what it means to trust and to love and to lean in. Our God is listening. The third thing we see is this amazing verse, verse 39. Verse 37, Elijah says this. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back to you. Elijah says, answer me, God, so that people will know you. Elijah teaches us that trust looks like trusting God for God's glory. Right? Trusting God for the end game of God receiving glory. Here's how I want to trust God. I want to trust God to take care of me. My things, my desires, my wishes, my pleasures. God bless me exclusively. But Elijah says this, God, I trust you to prove yourself to them. And here's what's so cool about this passage and was so convicting to me. Elijah knew that it was God's job to prove that God was God. Can I just take some burden off of you tonight? It isn't your job to prove that God is God. If tonight you just need to release that, If you have been trying so hard to prove that God is God to everyone around you, I hope you know that God is big. God is good and has really, really, really good timing. God proves himself because God gets the glory, and Elijah says, God, prove yourself so that you get the glory. When I was in high school, one of the most convicting things I feel like I ever heard from the Lord was I felt like God said to me, Katie... Let me know when you decide if you want them to love me or you. I was like, okay. (laughs) Sometimes my first response to conviction is apathy. Anyone else? I'm like, whatever. And then later I'm like, ugh. (laughs) I really did have the sense of God saying to me, let me know when you would like them to love me or you. Because the business that God is in is like hope, redemption, fulfillment everywhere, all things and all time, alpha and omega. The business of people liking me is going to let everyone down. I am broken and I've got issues and I get to reflect the creator, but it's not my job to be the creator. And what a sweet gift, friends, that it is not your job but we also get to trust God for God's own end. That's why this amazing passage in Matthew happens when they say Jesus teaches how to pray. And he says, okay, pray this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus says, let's just lay some ground rules here and understand that when you pray, pray for my kingdom to come and my will to be done first. What would it mean for us to trust God prove himself. For us to trust God that God is going to be God. And friends, what I'm beginning to realize is that this God is trustworthy as I continue to put my trust in him. The passage opens by saying, do you believe in Baal or God? Just choose one and follow them. 
Maybe tonight you just needed a reminder that this God is trustworthy. That this God is listening, that this God is for you, that this God knows your name, that this God can handle your anger. Because friends, here's what's amazing. Faith, in Hebrews, is being sure of what we hope for and certain in what we do not see. Faith is not, I for sure have no doubts and am positive about everything. So if tonight you're like, no, I, I, I can't trust God because I'm still confused about some things. Welcome to Christianity. Okay? If you know someone who's 100% sure, have them call me. I'll tell you my number, okay? About everything all the time, right? Faith is not being positive. Faith is being sure in what we hope for. I am sure that I am hoping for a God who will redeem and restore. I am sure that I am hoping for a God who will remove my transgressions from me. I am certain in a God who I can't even see. Friends, that kind of tends to pave way to doubt when God chose to be invisible. That was not helpful, right? Faith is being sure in what we hope for and certain in what we do not see. Tonight, friends, I want to ask you, are you waiting to be positive to trust a good God? Then you're never going to let him prove himself because you're never going to trust him. Maybe you just have to jump out of an airplane. Maybe it will be that simple for you. I'm praying that Hans shows up in your life too. (laughs) What would it look like tonight for you to say, God, how do I continue to trust you? What does it mean for me to be a person of faith even in the middle of my doubts and fears? And God, how can I take a step towards you this week at MOVE knowing that you are a God I can trust? Let's pray.